Canadian unemployment right now is running at about 5.5%. Yep. Barry's unemployment is running at 7.4%. Yep. Do you think government has any any in, influence any on that? Impact? Yeah. yeah, do they? Do you think they do? Or, or do you think it's all we smoke and mirrors? We do. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's really a smoke yeah. and mirrors, right? I mean, government really doesn't control the unemployment rate. Oh, in no way. Not, like 99. They measure it, but they can't control it. In, like 99. Yeah, it doesn't stop the media from coming and asking <laughs> right. the rates on. Right, because right. as I lead you down that path, mayor, you go, the mayor's, <laughs> mayor's got to be Wait a minute. <laughs> for making sure that. Then I get to be responsible when it's low, too. Anyway. Right. Um, no, the, the, the reality is um, the fundamental source of wealth in the world is adding value by adapting products and services so that they add they add value to a, to a willing buyer, right? That is a private sector right. task. Uh, what we choose to collectively um, uh, provide as services because we pay for them through our taxes and we endorse those decisions through uh, elections, that's, that is all dependent. Our ability to do that is all dependent on being able to generate prosperity uh, by adding value, whatever that is. So anyway, on, on, on the employment side, um, that's one of the major issues that, that we look in, in, at in Barry is, is this a value added economy? Are we doing things here that are increasing value and therefore are going to be better paid and more stable and have a long term business plan? Or are they jobs that are recycling money that's made elsewhere? Uh, because, yeah, those I mean, uh, so I my first job was fast food. I don't look down on anybody's job because it's low paid, high paid, hard work, not hard work. Um, work is work. If you work, it is noble. If you're choosing not to work, I don't think you should make that choice if you can work. But anyway, um, so I, I, I don't, uh, you know, as mayor, I don't, I don't say, oh, these are terrible jobs. All jobs are good jobs in the sense that they provide work. That being said, uh, people want to have careers. They want to be paid well enough to live well. We all aspire to a better life. And if we want to have those kinds of jobs in a community, it has to be about adding value, not recycling, recycling dollars. So when it comes to, to employment and unemployment, there's a lot more than just a headline number. And, and yeah, Barry's, I think we've been in the sevens uh, in the last few months. We were down as low as 3% uh, late last year. That number jumps around because, again, what's unique about Barry, we're growing faster than the uh, economy sometimes. We're growing slower, but we're always growing. So if you add 2,000 people every year, if you don't add 1,500 jobs, um, or if you only add 1,500 jobs, your unemployment rate's going to go up. But you added 1,500 jobs, the unemployment rate, because you're, it's a measure of the labor market. More people move than got jobs. So you got to look behind those numbers and right. see, are they full-time jobs? Or are they part-time? Are they well-paid? Are they not? Is it Are they value-added sectors or are they recycling existing money? Yeah. That's economic strength. The, the, the unemployment rate brings me to uh, uh, provincial governments that have... And, and municipal ones that have tried to manipulate the economy to stabilize it so there's less ups and downs. So, um, Keynesian economics, yeah. Spend, spend to. Sure. Uh, yeah. Toronto put um, yep. uh, foreign investment tax on sure. to, slow, to yeah. slow the hot housing market. Yep. In my eyes, uh, I think private sector should be allowed to run its capitalistic ways, mm -hmm. and the government is not there to control it but to make sure the services are in play to help yep. nurture it. Yep. Uh, and when government gets involved in that, see, I think, so with, with Toronto housing, they talk about affordable housing. If Toronto, let's say Toronto didn't have affordable housing, mm -hmm. wouldn't that just make uh, places like Barrie, Ontario prosper because people would move out of the city and come here because we are affordable to live here? Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't see the, I don't see the bad if, if Ontario, if Toronto didn't have it. Because by the way, the minute Toronto can't sell a house, the prices would drop anyway. Yeah. So if the houses are still selling at a million dollars a house and you go, I'm out, I'm going to move to Barrie. This also helps Barrie. So I, I, when, when the city of Toronto makes decisions like that, does that drastically affect us up here? Yeah. So does that slow our housing market down when they, when they yeah. do stuff like that? Well, actually that slowed our housing market a little bit, um, not because we were having as much foreign direct investment, but because it put a chill on the real estate. Right. Market. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. It slowed down Toronto, which slowed down us. Right. And we've only started to recover in the last sort of three or four months. Um, but that, uh, that uh, really, really hot real estate market that occurred a few years ago from 2014 to 2017, the space of three years, the, the average price of a home in Barrie doubled. It also doubled in Toronto, right? But it went in Toronto from seven or eight hundred thousand to, to one point six million yep. or something unbelievable. And in Barrie, the average price went from three hundred to six hundred thousand, right? So yeah, it all it all rises up because it is one giant regional market in the sense that 
If you have a job in the, in the edges of Toronto, the suburbs of Toronto, particularly the North End, uh, it's feasible to live in Barrie and commute. And people make that choice. I mean, that's that's right. driven so much growth in Barrie. And, you know, of course, a lot of the employment now has moved to like Mississauga, Vaughan. Vaughan is re- like red hot right now. Um, uh, Richmond Hill, place, Markham, places like that. That's all north of Toronto. And you you can live in a Barrie or a Newmarket or an Aur- or Aurora. And make get it. Get a nice home. Yeah, for sure. And make it. But I, I guess to your point about the pricing. Um, the leave, challenge- leave, leave private sector to do what they're doing. I mean, listen, yeah. everything between minimum wage and, and, and taxes uh, on foreign investment. Every time the government seems to shove their nose in and trying to manipulate the private sector, yeah. it sends it into a, a tizzy, yeah. a spasm. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and I see it affect people more so worse than better yeah. every time government does okay we're gonna we're gonna add uh, we're gonna we're gonna increase minimum wage by the way in the minimum wage thing i'm part of the canadian federation of independent business yeah. and uh when government says we're gonna increase minimum wage and we're gonna give all of you business people three months to figure this out yeah. i signed contracts a year in advance yeah. in some of my corporations yeah. and you gave me three months to overcome this hurdle guess what the only thing that happened yeah. your un- unemployment rate went from 6.8 to 7.4 because i had to manage a economic impact that i had no control of yeah and the and the pace of change this is one of the issues that we have with the current government and that uh, frankly that minimum wage issue which was the previous ontario government same problem when uh, we in business i you know for 10 years i ran a business you thrive on certainty. Your clients thrive right. on certainty. You right. build supplier relationships and price relationships uh, that are, in some cases, many years out. You have contracts that are many years out. You have expansion plans that take take years if you're building a new store, if you're a restaurant, whatever it is. So when a government comes along and, and in two or three uh, months uh, pulls the, the rug out by changing one of your economic fundamentals, that's a it's it's a huge problem. I mean, I guess the interesting question around that is uh, uh, government intervention into the market. So I'm an economist by background, and I believe the reason that government should uh, government's role in a free market in a ca- in the capitalist system, which is the most powerful economic system that's ever right. been invented, the uh, if you're uh, the the government's role is to correct market failures. So a market failure is kind of like. But shouldn't you have a market failure? Oh, like, well, like that, that, markets those don't work perfectly on their own, though. They don't don't they? No. Look, if hey, you read Iron, if you read Iron Rand, Rand and Atlas Shrugged, you would, you would argue differently that the, that you, the capitalist you markets would, would yeah. find their own balance yeah. and their own ups and downs. It, they would correct themselves eventually, and actually sometimes faster than what government does when the government in, inflicts their own. But you pr- know, in Atlas Shrugged, you had Midas Mulligan. You had a banker <clears throat> who was an honorable person who uh, lent money to those who actually generated value through the power of their minds. Uh, whether it was Hank Reardon right. or Francis, yeah, Hogan, look at you, Hogan, okay, Dagny Taggart. These were people who uh, they, you know, the banks gave money to, and there was a, a return on that investment, and it was a clear exchange based on respect and equal knowledge. Unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. Look at the financial crisis in the United States. It's the best best reason I can ever imagine for uh, government intervention in the states. You had uh, the banks, uh, you had people out there doing ninja loans. No income, no job. Okay, but no that's asset. but that's because that's because the government decided to allow them to write mortgages without equity. Yeah. So, so, so the government in, the government in, but the, in but the, the government actually set up the regulation. Activity. If the government had left the mortgage business the way it was, they would have never had that problem. The, the, they decided to allow banks to borrow. Uh, I can't remember now the exact figures, but uh, for every dollar you had in in in, a, in the bank. You were allowed to borrow twenty three bucks, and right. somewhere they Whatever said instead of that, we're going to let you borrow thirty three dollars on that sure. dollar, and then it became forty dollars on that dollar, yeah. and the, and they and, and the government put in a piece of legislation that allowed those banks to abuse some somebody who sure. didn't have the intellectual the intellectual capacity to understand right. that they were over their head. That's right. So left unto themselves. The banks will act in that way. But the government, the government gave them permission to, to do it. Stop, the the laws that. prior to that oh, were fine. I, hey, I, I think the, the U.S., you're absolutely right. I think the U.S. regulations were far too loose. We didn't have that in Canada. It's one of the reasons we didn't have big banks fail during the financial crisis. Totally, yeah, large, I agree. We don't have ninja loans in Canada. But that's government intervention in the market. That's the government going in and saying, banks, you must act in this way to correct the market sometimes failure I, of information. Right, but sometimes the government gets involved when everything's working fine. Oh, we don't always get this right. I'm just saying you can't you can't back out completely. You cannot back right. out completely uh, and, and expect that the capitalist system can just run 
all by itself without market failures. So that failure of banks being able to take advantage or loan sharks being able to take advantage of people. Even, uh, even if you look at, even if you look at, even government. if you look at minimum wage and let's assume minimum, raising minimum wage was a good idea. All right. They should have done it back in 2015. A hundred percent do it slower and over more time. And, and, and instead they, they, they bickered about it for two years. And when they finally, when they finally jettisoned it and finally got it going, the economy had already bubbled yeah. and they should have caught that on the up, not at the over, yeah. right? It should have, the minimum wage should have went up when they, when everything was going up and they literally implied it while they did uh, foreign investment tax, while they, um, uh, uh, raised uh, uh, gas prices and put tax on that when when uh, Donald Trump decided that NAFTA was a disaster. Yes. And then they go, and eh, we're going to do minimum wage on you at the same time, w- w- which was probably motivated, by the way, not for the betterment of the person making more money, but it was actually, that that was executed, and this is awful, It was, uh, I believe it was executed to improve Kathleen Wynne's opportunity to get back in power or the liberals to get back in power. It wasn't executed to actually improve uh, poverty. Sure. It was, because so, if it was, it would have done, been done at, a, at an appropriate time with the appropriate right. amount of governance to get it there rather than doing it the year before the election. Yeah. And I do remember myself and others saying to the government, it was too much too fast. And whatever the motivations were, it was too much too fast. I guess I got a question for you, though, about the, the Trump thing, right? So he introduced tariffs, right? Aluminum steel yeah. tariffs. That's like the worst form of government in intervention into capitalism you can have. You're basically saying you cannot sell to this this free exchange. You cannot right. have this. What would Hank Reardon have said about Donald Trump's tariffs on steel, right? Yeah, you know it's it's funny the and and uh, I'm about to say something and I'm going to maybe have this cut out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so I I deal with Chinese manufacturers, sure, and. Um, uh, I get stuff imported yep. and they, and everything's done by duty and tariff yep. and they actually write me. So I get a container of materials and they will actually write me an invoice less by 80% okay. to offset the tariff. Yeah. So they've all learning how to, yeah, to work it in, to, to work it in because they know that this is a challenge that everybody's tossing around. So ironically, the government imposes, see, this is the funny thing, the tighter the mousetrap, yeah. the more the private sector goes, okay, we're going to find it another way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, um, barter is really um, flourishing amongst trades yeah. because when you're, when you're a tradesman and you're making $80,000 a year and you're paying 51% income tax, you're like, sure. I'm going to start, and the government doesn't want you to barter, yeah. but yet really the only way you can get your garage built or finish your basement is through a barter and help each other. Yep. Yet, yet that's not really allowed within our system, the government. No, you can't barter. You got to tax each other on those things and we want to get our cut. And wait for cryptocurrency. Which just allows right? anybody to barter outside of the institutional system completely. I mean, this that's going to be an enormous challenge for governments, banks, everybody. Because well, and by the way, when we can just exchange actual currency and we don't need any of that anymore. Right. And ironically, cryptocurrency was created mm-hmm. in in the in the eventuality the government had intentions of removing paper currency right. off the market. Right. So government wanted to get rid of paper currency completely so they could one hundred percent control the amount of tax money they're getting because they know there's an underground economy they can't put a, a thumb on. And then the private corporation went, okay, we're going to, you want to go that way. We're going to invent another way to trade yeah. currency, which, which is kind of funny. Every time you build that mouse trap, yeah. you, another, the private enterprise goes, we've got to figure out another way around this because we, we, we feel like we're being pinned to the mat all the time. And most of government's job in, in a democratic world, we all, we, I hope we all believe in democracy, uh, is to take those collective aspirations of a people of a country or a city or whatever it is and say here uh, you know most of what we do is here's what we're going to pay for together and the level we're going to take that to and here's what we're not and some people will tell us you you know you need to do more we need to have uh, a broader healthcare system we need to have free tuition we know whatever those in the education system whatever that is and and others will say no we need you know the government shouldn't even be in the in the business of x y or z to me, the biggest question always is who can best deliver these things that are essential to our quality of life, right? And then there's the equity piece. I'm a Canadian. My basic take on this is everybody should have the equal opportunity to succeed. That does not mean uh, equality of income uh, among our entire population. That does not mean we redistribute from those who work hard to those who don't. And yeah, sure. The, the, listen, so, uh, I, I want to talk about some Barry issues because I, yeah, sure. I know your time's getting pinned, yeah. but I, I'll, I, I want to make a statement that um, 
the last 20 years, and Alex Burns sits across here with the camera in hand, the last 20 years, uh, we have a, an entire generation that what I've referred to and a lot of my colleagues refer to as a blue ribbon generation. You cannot fail. You will get passed from grade three to grade four. Um, you're guaranteed $15 an hour, whether you work hard or not. And, and, and even the $15, you know, the $14 for minimum wage or whatever it is right now from 1180. Uh, there was a moment in my, in my shop where I said, if you work harder, you'll get paid more. And that didn't count anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a guy that started in a basement apartment, by the way, uh, on unemployment insurance. Right. And I, and I, and I truly believe that if the government takes away social adversity, I don't believe anybody learns. I think the reason why you write an exam in school is because you're put under pressure mm -hmm. and un under that pressure, you end up learning more because you're, you could fail that exam. And the minute you say you won't fail that exam is the minute you don't need to study for it anymore. Right. I said this to, I said this to my union, which I'm not a member of. They asked me to join voluntarily. And I said, I would gladly join. I said, give me a six month contract. And if you don't give me the right of labor with the right education, with the, with the right skill set, I get to fire you. Right. And if I get, because you, I said, you're going to be the only the only sub trade, the only services I buy that I can't get rid of. Yep. And if I can't get rid of you, why would you service me better? And, and to some degree, I go to government. I go, I can't fire you. Yep. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I can fire the mayor. And I'll be honest, you're one voice in many. Yep. Right? For sure. Right. So the problem is, is that I have a, a, a garbage union, fire union, uh, police. I, I have a whole bunch of things going on. And there's no control or... People, our societies, we have less opportunity to fail because we've built a massive government social safety net around them, which then tells me that we don't have to perform like we used to. Right. When I was starving, I was up at four in the morning and I was working until one o'clock. You know this, you were in your own private business. And if somebody said to me, hey, Tim, I'm going to give you, back then, I'm going to give you $30,000 a year whether you work or not. Yeah. I don't think, I, I don't think Steve Jobs would have got out of his garage in Southern California and built computers and sold them for 24 hours a day. If somebody said, Hey, Steve Jobs, here's 30 grand a year, whether you work or not. I, I think we actually have created an environment where we don't have to perform. Yeah. Well, I would certainly agree with you that uh, some of the changes in the education system early on, uh, it, you know, we do not do our kids a service. Um, when we, when there is no such thing as failure, the re the, the reality is, uh, there are, you know, on a, a math test and now I am going to sound like, uh, uh, maybe Aristotle, not a, -N, but <laughs> a is a, right. I mean, if you, if you spell cat C E T, you spelt it wrong, right. You don't get a check mark and a, and a, and a participation. Listen, I'm a high school dropout. So I, you know, I, I do believe in that you have to have a, you got to have, uh, you have to teach, uh, that hard work, uh, you know has a reward. You have to have a system where hard work has a reward. And uh, you know, where I would go with that though, is this is philosophical you know, this is, now, no, not political. And I appreciate really that. Right, right. But, but, but no, this is true. If we keep passing uh, uh, or pretending that there is no such thing as failure, we're not equipping our kids to get out in the real world because they're going to civilization or civilization. Or right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I guess the, 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 the take I have too is um, you know, if there is no reward for hard work, why would, why work hard? Right. I, I quit high school because I failed everything. Right. And what I realized is that I couldn't perform in that scenario. So I went out and quit. Yep. My mother promoted me to quit because yep. she looked at me and went, you, you just don't get it. And you're not fitting in and you can't read and you can't write. Yeah. That didn't ironically fail. And I appreciate this doesn't work for everybody, but then we're not all the same. You said the yeah. same thing. You're, you're good job, bad job, high paying job, low paying job, long as you're working. But I, I couldn't fit that system. And because of my failures, I ended up being a success because you, you get kicked around enough and you're like, I'm not going to get kicked around anymore. And I think when you don't get kicked around, you, you don't rise to the occasion. Yeah. You can't win a war if you don't pull a gun out. You, you can't, unless you get a shovel, you're not going to dig a hole. Yeah. So my wife and I have an expression, which is sometimes- You have young kids, right? We have a, a 10 year old daughter. Yeah. And uh, the expression is sometimes you got to let them eat dirt, right? I mean, <laughs> otherwise, right. when your kid no, is three true. years old and yeah. they pick up a handful of dirt, I mean, you're not going to let them, you know, eat handfuls of dirt and <clears throat> right. make themselves really sick. But- when, you know, at some point, if they, if they're, you, you, you got to let people make some choices and know what the consequences of those choices are. And that's how to raise. All right. Let's talk about Barry. Sure. Um, probably number one complaint. I was in my office this morning. I said, okay, I'm going to go meet Mr. Mayor. Yeah. And they said, what about the homelessness sure. uh, downtown? Yeah. What, uh, by the way, I, I, you can't get rid of it. There's just no getting rid of it. How do you manage it? Yeah, for sure. Well, so here's the thing. It drives, it's, it drives everybody nuts. 
No, a hundred percent. And, and I, you know, we've had some, some conflict between downtown businesses who are, are, are you know, trying to deal with their customers and also well, when you're scared to walk downtown at nine o'clock yeah. at 10 o'clock at night uh, with your wife yeah. to get back to your car. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a couple of things in that. Number one is I think people are scared at how people look. I mean, oh, sure. I, don't, I don't judge look at you me. By how you, yeah, I don't, and you know what? I hope people don't Thanks. judge me by how I look right. on, a, on a Saturday morning. Uh, you know, when I'm going out to, to Tim's and I'm, I'm looking kind of rough, right? It's, but the point is, um, I, I think a lot of people are scared because we don't talk to each other anymore. And actually, there's not as much to be scared about as a lot of people think there sure. are. Now this, though. The fact is, it should disturb us all that there's a lot more homeless people. What's going on there? Why Why is that? What's actually the root cause? Why are they homeless? Mental health is a huge piece of it because they're, we used to have institutional care. In the uh, 70s. In, in the 80s. That's right. And right. a lot of it closed. Uh, and, you know, for good reasons, in some cases, some of those places were horrible. But, I, you know, I, I had a relative who lived in a, a home in Montreal and he basically ended up living on the street for a lot of his life um, because he was on medication for, for a couple of serious mental conditions. And there, there was just no other place to go. There was no place for, there was no place for him to go. And so uh, you either say, okay, we're going to accept that. As you say, you're not going to end it. We're going to accept it. Um, or we're going to try and find some places for them to go and, and provide some mental health uh, care in this country um, to match the, the, you know, the, the problem. Um, the other long-term issue for me, for the city, you know, the city of Erie downtown, busy streets are safer streets, right? So uh, King and Spadina, Byward Market, uh, Gastown in Vancouver, where you have thousands of people living in a neighborhood, whether they are living on the street or living uh, in an apartment, the streets are busy, they're safer. People are less concerned about that mix. Right. It all just kind of organically happens together sure. and it works a lot better. When you don't have that, when the streets are empty, except for people who uh, are either, uh, you know, homeless or are preying on the homeless drug dealers or yep. others, uh, then you've got a real problem. And and so, you know, I think busy streets is a big part of the answer to this, which is why we're trying to have so many more people living downtown. we got a whole bunch of development happening. Yeah. So what's happening at Five Points? Yeah. Five Points, Barry Central, the theater block, the former dairy site, the site right here at Collier and Owen. All of those are scheduled for redevelopment in the next three or four years. Uh, really? Because people have heard people have heard this before, right? For the last 10 years, uh, there's no, been questions, so. comments. The, on, the only one of those sites that's been proposed before is the dairy. The, uh, the Lakeview right. Dairy has been vacant for about 25 years, and there have been different proposals there over the years. But those that one's the reason it's wrapped in all that pretty marketing uh, posters around the fence of that site is because they're selling condos now, as is the Five Points. So they're taking registrations for sales. I have to think that means they intend to move forward. Um, the other one's Barry Central. I mean, that was torn down last year. It's it's newly vacant. But it looks terrible. It's, uh, you know, we want to see that site redeveloped. Yep. Uh, it's a developer out of uh, Kitchener called HIP uh, Developments, uh, who are the front end for a major construction company. They got a good track record. So they want to do three buildings there. And then the theater block, of course, is occupied. And I think a lot of people are going to be upset when the uh, when that theater finally closes. But what is proposed to replace it is is pretty dramatic. And I think there's going to be a, a kind of interesting conversation because that one's not approved yet. That's one where it's going to come to city council. There's two 35 story buildings that are proposed there. Really? So, yeah, going to be a big discussion around that and a whole retail podium. And, and yeah, I think downtown should be um, um, high density. Well, and I do too. I, what I hear from people in Barrie against that is they don't want like a, a whole forest of high rises ringing the waterfront. I get that. Um, but it's going to come anyway. Well, and as a city that grows, I mean, it, you're a block or two back, actually, when you're on Dunlop or certainly on Collier, you're a block or two back. The one building that's going in on the Lakeview Dairy site. Absolutely. That's going to you're today. You can walk along there, look through the fence and see the water. Tomorrow you won't. Um, the, but the reality but is be a promenade a story be, building yeah, right. or a 30 story right. building. You can't see past it to the water. Um, There's such better tax base so, for you guys in high density. Uh, it is. It's a better use of land. It's more customers for the downtown shops and services, busier streets, all that kind of good stuff. And, and it helps the homeless problem. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest issues for people uh, is, you know, it's a historic downtown um, and they want to see it thrive. But the reality is if we don't have customers for the businesses, it's not going to thrive. Right. Uh, what about pot? Do we yeah. have pot stores coming what to Barry? What about pot? 
Um, <laughs> do we have pot stores I never, coming? I never exhaled. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the no, I don't think we do. It's weird, right? Like, is it not a municipal? This, it's a municipal licensing thing, isn't no, it? Don't, it's the Ford government. This is so sorry. Weird. I thought I thought lottery. each city had it. Okay, yeah, right. So okay, so like municipalities can set some rules around where the stores can go, but the whether you are allowed to open a pot store is this lottery that the province did, and it's so weird. They drew these names for each of the districts in Ontario. These right. are the people who are going to get, we have no idea if any of those names are in Barrie. We don't think so because we don't recognize any of them. Um, that's the weirdest system. They literally drew names out of a drum. Uh, and so now we don't know. And I mean, I here's my prediction. This is a huge industry with a ton of money in it already and more to come. Right. And the big names, the canopies are going to start consolidating like every other industry does. It starts with a whole bunch of startups, little and big, but the very quickly, the big start to gobble up some of the small and they, they, because they're able to produce a more consumer friendly store environment and expand more, more rapidly. So just like every other industry, I think you'll see the lead, the dominant uh, companies or the lead companies in a couple of years, trying to put stores in every Canadian, every Canadian city. Where do you see Barry's population in 10 years? Right now we're around uh, 190, 200. No, but actually about 150. Okay. And, Sorry, online and, it uh, says uh, 195, I think. So that's the census metropolitan area. So when right. you include some of the like Innisville and Springwater, right. our CMA is about 200. Yeah. City of Barry itself is just over 150. But our, you're right. Our broader area is about 200. 10 years from now, broader area about 250. City of Barry about 180, 190. 20, 22, 23 years from now, we're supposed to be a quarter of a million people. Really? Yeah, ton of growth. Coming. Are you going to stay in politics? Uh, I hope so. That's going to be up to the people. I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> but your intention, I'm your intention, not to get fired. your intentions is to stay, stay yeah. where you are? Well, so, yeah, I love my job. I mean, Why don't you go pro provincial? People have suggested that or federal, right? Uh, partisan politics, I don't have a lot of patience for. It's just. It's do you consider yourself to be a socialist, or do you consider yourself no, to be a capitalist? I'm, I'm in the middle of the road. Um, I'm, oh, I'm definitely a capitalist. I mean, uh, so I'm a social progressive. I really believe the government should not be telling people how to live, and we should be trying to teach people to to be nice to one another a little bit more than they are today. But I'm a fiscal conservative. I mean, I'm I every year in this job as mayor, I've cut debt at, in the, at the city of Barrie, and I'm proud of that because I think we got to put the credit card away as society. And I don't think the government can spend its way to solving all our problems, but we can sure be doing a lot more to address those problems by being innovative, by stop being so risk averse as, as government. We are so afraid to try something new. Well, because you're uh, scared you're going to get fired. Because, because we politicians are scared we're going to yeah. get fired and because we bureaucrats uh, are afraid that the politicians will fire us. Because, you know, if God forbid something go wrong or look bad and, and you know what, the, the, it's changing. And, you, you know, you talked about millennials earlier. I actually, you know, this, the, the new generation care about impact, right? They, they, you're right about their loyalty, maybe in a job is, is not there, but then, you know, employers haven't been all that loyal to them either, but you know, where they are loyal is when they believe that their job has some significance. And I don't mean just, you know, changing the world or making the world a better place. It, it may be making money, but whatever it is that's important to them, if they are part of it. We have a young workforce here at the city and, and so many of them work for the city because they want to make an impact on their community in one way or another, running day camps, uh, better fire protections, uh, better mental health, whatever it is, libraries, uh, future libraries. And, uh, you know, I think those are the people that are going to help me continue to, to try and do more as government without spending more money, which we, we, we will never spend our way to solving. some. Of I find the, I find the, as we wrap up, I find the millennial generation to be more socially, um, more socialist. Uh, they want more social services. They think the government should be providing, uh, everything from dental to university education for free. Mm. And I, and I, and I, and I believe that as they get older and, and start paying their own taxes and have their own rent and their own mortgages and they pull away from their parents' basements, uh, they go, oh, that maybe I don't want my government to do all those things. Do you think there are more socialists coming up to the ranks? I think young people, it's not generational. I think when you're younger in life, you are always- I think all of us are the same way. Yeah. I think as you, I, I mean, you can just look at any polling that you right. want. I agree. People in their fifties and sixties are far more conservative about the role of government than people in their twenties and thirties. I think you got to listen to young people though, because it's their future. And the fact is, the fact is we, we can't afford some of the things that you're talking about. I, I actually believe that too, but we shouldn't cop out and say, that means we're not going to try. 
because there are organizations out there. I talked this morning about social enterprise. Social enterprise is a profit making organization that stands on its own financial merit, but has a social purpose, right? The furniture bank in Toronto is a great example. It repurposes furniture for people on low income. It makes a profit. It's got a $4 million budget and it employs people with barriers to employment. That's going to be, that's not the future of the whole economy because we're, uh, we, we, uh, we're not going to add enough value in doing that to continue to operate. But when we talk about um, doing things differently or trying, you know, that's a bridge between government and the private sector. That's using the power of capitalism to tackle some social issues. Uh, government, if we tried to do that, we would flop completely. Right. We, would, we would overbuild the program. We would be so scared to try something new. We would probably screw it up. The marketing would be embarrassingly bad because we're bad that way too. And I'm saying this of my own people and my own organization. We're just not built to do that kind no. of a thing. But a social enterprise is, and it acts like a startup, and it's fiscally sustainable. So let's do, let's talk about Uber. Sure. Did it screw the taxi cab licenses in Barrie? No, it's uh, you know it like it did in Toronto. Yeah, yeah. It's, right. Uh, there were some predictions of doom and gloom. No, we deregulated, and everything was fine. Because that, eh? Because funny enough, that's yeah. where technology came in and yeah. beat the well, crap out of a lot of cities. But here's what happened with their licenses in our in our town. There were 13 cab companies. Yep. The two largest are something like 80 percent of the market. Those two companies built apps. Right. Look at that. They did. You know what? It actually. So you didn't fight it, it Uber when it came service. in. Uh, we did a little bit initially. And then we said, no, we're going to be the first. I'm proud of this. We're the first and only, as far as I know, a major Canadian city that doesn't set the price of a taxi fare. We actually backed out a price. Like, I don't set the price of milk. I don't, set the, <laughs> I don't tell you what, what your lawyer should charge. <laughs> no, you're, you're totally the, right. The city bylaw doesn't set the fee for banking or for lawyer or any other consumer product. Like, why were we setting the price of a cab fare? Let the free market determine. But you charge licensing fees for those cabs. So we do the same base fee for everybody, Uber, um, uh, rideshare, uh, designated driver companies okay. to cover some very basic regulations. Safety, right? Safety sure. of the vehicle. And to make sure the drivers don't have criminal records. And that's, that's our regulation. We, we keep the public safe by doing that in the same way that, you know, commercial truckers are, are regulated by the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, maybe a bad example because there have been some, some, some bad incidents lately as well. But the point is, we, uh, what we said was, it's not the government's job to set the price of something. People will determine how much they're willing to pay for it by the quality of the service or the good that they receive. That's capitalism, man. And uh, it is the government's job, though, to make sure that people don't get exploited uh, because either, uh, you know, you've got somebody dangerous or you've got a vehicle that shouldn't be on the road, right? right? Transporting the public. Like you wouldn't want your kids hopping in a cab that's got no floor on it right. uh, because somebody's run a car to ruin it. I find Uber gives a better product than the cab companies. And in, in which case people will use Uber more. That's the way, that's the way the market works. That's capitalism. And, and if, a, if a cab company ups its game, provides a better service right. in some way than Uber, then maybe they can knock out Uber. I don't know. But that's that's a free market. When's the next election? Not for three more years. I'm going to try and get some stuff done. I just got reelected last fall. So, yeah, I got three years to get things done. Sounds like a long time. Do you remember how long it takes? <laughs> right. Mr. Mayor. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. I'm Tim Byrne. This is Tim Byrne Almost Live. Uh, I am your Wednesday night drive home. And I want you to remember this. You uh, You want to be a hero. You stick your head above that foxhole. You have a good night.